Starting in the 2010s, China's navy went on a shipbuilding spree. Destroyers and frigates were being built one after another, and even aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships were being constructed at a rapid pace. It's obvious to anyone paying attention that this large-scale military buildup is preparing for war. Xi Jinping was able to secure a third term because he made it clear that he wants to resolve the Taiwan issue. Many experts predict that China might make a move around 2027, but some military experts warn that we shouldn't wait that long. The People's Liberation Army could provoke military bases in the U.S., Japan, or Taiwan as early as next year. U.S. Air Mobility Command's General Mike Minahan issued a direct order to his 110,000 troops, telling them to be ready for war with China within two years. The Americans are fully aware of the CCP's intentions. Recently, Chinese Premier Li Qiang visited Russia, sending a strong signal that the China-Russia relationship is rock solid. This suggests that Xi Jinping remains firmly in control, and military action against Taiwan is pretty much a given at this point. The Center for Strategic and International Studies used war games to predict that China would likely provoke the conflict by using cluster bombs to destroy U.S. and Japanese planes on the ground. Of course, the response from the U.S. and Japan would be swift and impressive. Within half an hour, they could destroy hundreds of China's low-orbit military satellites. The U.S. military had various anti. Anti-satellite weapons, including the Aegis fleet, ground-based mid-course defense systems, ASM-135 anti-satellite missiles, laser weapons, and cyber attacks, making it relatively easy to target China satellites. In contrast, the U.S. Starlink system has thousands of satellites, making it much harder for China to effectively attack. Additionally, the U.S. has a far superior ability to replenish satellites compared to China. In the satellite domain, China is clearly at a disadvantage. Following this, the U.S. and Japan would likely deploy their most advanced weapons, knowing that fighting the PLA is no joke, and they can't afford to be careless. Within the first three hours of the conflict. U.S. and Japanese warplanes could destroy China's coastal airports, air defense missile sites, and early warning aircraft. F-35 stealth fighters would launch anti-radiation missiles to take out China's long-range air defense systems, such as the S-300, S-400, and HQ-9. And the PLA's ship-based air defense systems wouldn't escape either. In comparison, the equipment that the Chinese military can deploy effectively is quite limited. Although the J-20 is touted as a stealth fighter, its stealth capabilities are far inferior to the F-35, and its maneuverability is very poor. It lacks air combat capabilities compared to the F-35, both in beyond visual range and close range dogfights. Additionally, there hasn't been any sign of the J-20 being equipped with supporting cruise missiles, anti-radiation missiles, or satellite guided bombs. As a result, it would pose no real threat to U.S. and Japanese airports, command centers, or air defense systems. If the PLA does send out the J-20, they would likely suffer heavy losses at the start of the conflict. The correct move for them would be to immediately retreat to the west for safety. Furthermore, the F-35 also has strong electronic warfare capabilities, allowing it to effectively suppress missiles launched from China's coastal areas, significantly reducing their combat effectiveness. China's missile launch vehicles and rocket artillery positions would likely become key targets for U.S. strikes. Additionally, China's coastal shipyards might be targeted by U.S. JASSM cruise missiles, which would hamper the Chinese Navy's ability to continue fighting. At sea, U.S. bombers could fire the LRASM anti-ship missiles to attack Chinese aircraft carriers, destroyers, and other large naval vessels. U.S. nuclear submarines could also launch Tomahawk cruise missiles or Harpoon anti-ship missiles, posing a significant threat to the Chinese Navy. Particularly, the U.S.'s heavy torpedoes would be difficult for even China's newest Type 055 destroyers to defend against. It's no exaggeration to say that a single U.S. nuclear submarine, with a bit of luck, could take out dozens of China's Type 055 destroyers. This could even lead to a competition between U.S. strategic bombers and submarines over who could sink more Chinese surface vessels. Given the situation, China would have to rely more on its submarine force. However, China's submarine fleet has relatively limited anti-submarine warfare capabilities, while the U.S., Japan, and Taiwan have more advanced systems. 
the U.S. Virginia class, nuclear submarines have excellent stealth and powerful sonar systems, which enable them to effectively track Chinese submarines. In addition, the anti-submarine patrol aircraft, helicopters, and fixed sonar arrays used by the U.S. and Japan pose a significant threat to Chinese subs. In surface naval confrontations, China might adopt a saturation attack strategy using anti-ship ballistic missiles (ASBMs) to strike U.S. vessels. However, after these missiles are launched, they are easily detected by the U.S. military. U.S. ships can defend against them using strong electronic jamming and decoy systems. And for the final stage of interception, they can rely on standard missile six (SM6) air defense missiles. The result of the war games shows that U.S. and Japanese warships in the Western Pacific would either be destroyed or forced to retreat to the Eastern Pacific. As for the Chinese Navy, they would have nowhere to run and would eventually be wiped out. Out. Within three weeks of the conflict starting, the U.S. could send all 130 of China's main warships to the bottom of the ocean. At that point, the smartest move for the PLA would be to abandon their ships and head ashore to save the lives of their officers and soldiers. In the end, both sides would likely start bombarding each other's airports and air bases with cluster bombs. The airports along China's coast and in the eastern region, if not destroyed, would have to quickly relocate their aircraft to the mountains or deserts in the. West to avoid further setbacks, but no matter how they try to hide, the U.S. stealth bombers would be flying everywhere, and the PLA's planes would have to take shelter inside mountain caves to stay safe. If they really can't find a place to hide, they might as well fly to Russia. Even if the planes can hide, the aircraft manufacturing plants in the Western region can't. Once they're bombed, how will they produce replacement parts? In the end, they might have to move the factories into the mountains. But even then, the U.S. still has bunker Busting bombs waiting for them. According to the U.S. war games, most of the losses on both sides would not come from aircraft being shot down in the air, but from being bombed on the ground. The imagined large-scale air battles between the J-20 and F-35 likely won't happen. China lacks reliable long-range strategic bombers, and when the conflict starts, they would be left with only a few medium to long-range missiles, leaving them with almost no real counterstrike capabilities. But even the survivability. Of those weapons is questionable. To reduce the risk of being struck in the early stages of a conflict, the U.S. military has made some strategic adjustments. For example, the most vulnerable base in Okinawa. Does not host F-35 fighters. Instead, they are stationed at bases on the Japanese mainland, such as Misawa and Iwakuni. As for Taiwan, it remains unclear whether the U.S. has already deployed F-35s in underground gurs there. It is likely that the U.S. will retain some necessary forces in the Western Pacific, while the bulk of their combat power might withdraw to relatively safer locations like Guam and Hawaii. According to U.S. military exercises, if tensions rise in the Taiwan Strait, they could complete their force deployment in the Western Pacific within four days. Given that China might send some signals before launching large-scale military operations, the U.S. military is likely to closely monitor the situation and be ready to respond in advance. In this scenario, whether Chinese leader Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin can quickly secure the first island chain and establish an anti-access Area denial system is debatable. Given Russia's less than stellar performance on the battlefield in Ukraine, its ability to support China might be quite limited. On the other hand, the U.S. has already made its stance clear. If challenged, they're ready to respond. The topic of anti-access area denial (A2AD) is indeed interesting. Japan's Ministry of Defense recently released its 2024 defense white paper, which gave us a surprising revelation: the DF-21D missile has suddenly disappeared. In 2023, there were still 70 DF-21 variants listed, but by 2024, only the DF-21A and E versions remain, while the DF-21B, C, and D have vanished. The much-hyped DF-21D anti-ship missile, which China had boasted about, seems to have been abandoned by the Chinese themselves. This essentially amounts to a public admission that these highly touted weapons were just paper tigers. 
The PLA originally planned to rely on the Dongfeng Express missiles to support their A2AD system, but now that they can't even keep those, how can they maintain an effective A2AD strategy? Ironically, the U.S. and its allies have already built their own anti-access system right under the PLA's nose. Systems like the Dark Eagle and CPS missiles, with ranges stretching thousands of kilometers, now cover most of China. This puts time-sensitive CCP targets in a very vulnerable position. The PLA used to boast about their A2AD strategy, but now it's been turned against them. Once the sea battle is over, what's next? Landing on the Chinese mainland, of course. Over the years, the CCP has poured endless money into their navy and air force, but their army's equipment is severely lacking. If the Allies actually begin a land invasion of China, the PLA's ground forces might not even be able to organize a proper defense. Defeat would just be a matter of time. The fact that the CCP reaches this point in the war games is closely tied to their approach to weapons development. In simple terms, they've been too focused on flashy, impressive-looking technology that, in reality, is nothing more than an empty show. Take the example of mid-range air-to-air missiles. China's PL-15 missile uses a dual-pulse motor, and when this technology came out. Chinese media hyped it up, talking about how advanced and impressive it was. The idea behind dual pulse is that the missile can ignite its engine twice: one to accelerate after launch, and again to give it a boost when approaching the target, ensuring it stays locked on. Sounds pretty high tech, right? But here's the catch. There's something you might not have heard about. To make those two ignitions possible, they had to add a bunch of heat-resistant materials and reinforce the structure. The result: the missile got bulkier, but the thrust didn't increase much at all. Meanwhile, the U.S.'s AIM-120D missile doesn't use dual-pulse technology, but thanks to its superior control and guidance system, it utilizes a lofted trajectory. Especially when fired from altitudes of 10,000 meters or even 5,000 meters, the range extension is better than what you'd get with dual pulse. Of course, if you're launching above 20,000 meters, lofted trajectories don't offer much of an advantage either. These two technologies are really just different approaches, each with their own advantages, and there's no need to claim one is inherently better than the other. In fact, the dual pulse technology was something the U.S. experimented with decades ago. Patriot air defense missile used it, but the U.S. didn't see much need for it in mid-range air-to-air missiles. What's interesting is that the U.S. is now applying this dual pulse technology to a small air-to-air missile called Kuda. This little guy weighs only 68 kilograms, even smaller than a typical dogfight missile. It shows that the U.S. is highly skilled in miniaturizing rocket engines, an area where China still has some catching up to do. Why did the U.S. develop such a small missile? The answer is simple: more missiles mean greater combat capability. By being able to carry more of these into the air, the operational effectiveness increases significantly. And with a dual pulse engine, Kuda can maintain high maneuverability when approaching its target. In air combat, if the enemy tries to dodge, Kuda can fire another burst of thrust, increasing the likelihood of hitting its target. When you look at how China approaches the development of air-to-air missiles, it becomes clear that the dual pulse technology isn't really about cost effectiveness or practical thrust. It's about showing off. The small technical details don't seem to matter as much as the need to put it on display and tell the world, "Look, we have this technology." It's a classic case of seeking grandeur for its own sake. In recent years, China has often used various tactics to embellish the performance of its military equipment, trying to create the image of a powerful force. However, this self-deception doesn't hide their technical shortcomings. Instead, it leads to widespread skepticism and ridicule within professional circles. Take the range and combat radius of fighter jets, for example. China frequently calculates these figures under highly favorable conditions. For instance, they'll use an optimal high, high, high flight path and carry extremely light weapons loads to produce impressive-looking figures. But in actual combat, this configuration would almost never be used, making these figures more like theoretical estimates rather than practical battlefield realities. In contrast, the U.S. military adheres to much stricter standards, often choosing a high, medium, medium, high flight path and factoring in the heavy load of ground attack weapons to ensure their data is both realistic and applicable in actual combat situations. 
Take the F-35 series, for example. Thanks to its advanced fifth-generation engine technology and excellent fuel efficiency, the F-35 far surpasses Chinese jets in terms of internal fuel range and combat radius. The F-35A, with an internal fuel efficiency coefficient of 38.4%, can achieve over 4,000 kilometers of ferry range without needing external fuel tanks. Interviews with pilots confirm that the actual range of the F-35A And F-35C is far greater than that of the F-16 and the Typhoon, which is listed at 3,700 kilometers. According to official data, the F-35A's range, when fully loaded, is around 3,150 kilometers, and when unloaded, it can easily exceed 4,000 kilometers. This demonstrates the careful attention the U.S. military gives to ensuring their numbers are not just impressive on paper, but also applicable in real-world scenarios. The inflated numbers that China uses in their calculations may appear to match the F-35 on paper, but in real operations, they fall far short. One of the biggest issues comes up during actual flight. When comparing U.S. and Chinese standards, Chinese jets calculate their range, allowing for only the last four minutes of cruising, whereas U.S. jets allow for 20 minutes. Moreover, the U.S. doesn't even count the descent portion of the cruise in their range calculations. When you adjust for these differences, Chinese aircraft's real range is about 400 to 500 kilometers shorter than what their published data suggests. Now let's talk about China's supposed anti-stealth capabilities. When the CCP boasts about its anti-stealth radars, it sounds impressive, with claims that their meter wave radar can detect American stealth aircraft. But in reality, meter wave radar has a lot of issues. First, its detection accuracy is far too low to be used for fire control guidance. Second, it has numerous detection blind spots, especially for low altitude targets, making it practically useless in those situations. On top of that, its ability to filter out clutter is extremely poor. So, picking out a target from low altitude interference is like finding a needle in a haystack. Moreover, meter wave radar systems are large, expensive, and would likely be priority targets during a conflict. Take the example of how Israel destroyed Syria's Chinese-imported meter wave radar systems. Because of their massive size, these systems can't be mounted on early warning aircraft, which severely limits their effectiveness in combat. Infrared detection, while useful, has significant limitations. Due to size constraints, it's several orders of magnitude less efficient than radar, and is heavily affected by weather conditions. As long as an aircraft avoids using afterburners, doesn't fly too fast, and stays relatively low, its infrared signature can be managed pretty well. The difference between the infrared signals of an aircraft flying at high altitude and high speed compared to one flying low and slow can be enormous, sometimes by a factor of dozens. A detection range difference of five to ten times is entirely normal. For instance, the Eurofighter Typhoon's IRST can detect aircraft over 100 kilometers away at high altitude and speed, but at low altitude and speed, the detection range drops to just over 10 kilometers. If the J-20 relies on supersonic cruising, its infrared signal would spike drastically, making it much easier to detect. So all the hype around the J-20's ability to cruise at supersonic speeds isn't that practical when considering infrared detection. Taking everything into account, China's anti-stealth capabilities are arguably worse than Iraq's air defense system back in the day. U.S. stealth aircraft could come and go as they pleased, attacking targets at will with little to no resistance. Yet the CCP continues to dream of having effective anti-stealth capabilities. Russia's war in Ukraine has thrown a wrench into China's plans. They've made enemies everywhere, and their image of invincibility is crumbling. If things continue this way, the CCP might find itself dragged into the mess. There's even word that during the Beihai De meeting, Xi Jinping and the old guard are likely discussing how to deal with the aftermath of Putin's failures. Xi might well be planning to stir up some trouble in the Taiwan Strait as a distraction. Right now, China is making quite a push with its Type 003 aircraft carriers, which is equipped with the J-35 stealth fighter touted as their latest trump card. However, if the J-35 were to face off against the U.S.'s F-35, it would be a tough fight. The J-35 does have better stealth performance than the J-20, making it potentially more effective in air combat and in suppressing air defense systems. 
But the problem is, as the J-35 gets closer to entering service, the more its publicly disclosed performance seems to drop. Its empty weight has gone up, and its ceiling and combat radius have all gone down. The F-35, on the other hand, has an air-to-air -air combat radius greater than 1,390 kilometers. While the exact flight path isn't specified, if we look at other U.S. military aircraft, they typically use a high-medium-medium-high flight path. If the F-35 were to fly the more optimal high-high-high path, its combat radius could probably reach around 1,600 to 1,700 kilometers. In contrast, the J-35's optimal high-high-high combat radius is only about 1,200 kilometers, which doesn't come close to matching the F-35's. Its internal fuel capacity is noticeably smaller than the F-35s, and with two medium-thrust engines that burn more fuel, the J-35 struggles in terms of range. In short, the J-35 might be an upgrade for China's Navy, but when it comes to competing with the F-35, especially in terms of range and efficiency, it's clearly at a disadvantage. While the J-35 can reach a speed of 1.8 Mach and has a slightly higher ceiling than the F-35, these specs don't mean as much in real life. The official performance data for the F-35 is deliberately conservative. The true speed and altitude capabilities aren't publicly disclosed. Moreover, the service ceiling depends heavily on aircraft weight. According to Chinese standards, the service ceiling typically refers to conditions with about 35% fuel load. For instance, the F-16V can exceed 18,000 meters when lightly loaded, but official U.S. figures only list 15,000 meters. This isn't just the case for the F-16V. Even the F-22 is officially listed with a 15,000-meter ceiling. On the U.S. Air Force website, almost all the planes, except for the F-15, are listed with a ceiling of 15,000 meters. So what do these numbers really mean? Not much. They're more of a reference, with little practical significance in real operations. The bigger issue for the J-35 right now is its engines. Its two medium-thrust engines don't produce as much power as a single F-135 engine in the F-35. On top of that, the J-35 is larger in size, has a greater wetted area, and therefore more aerodynamic drag. Its maneuverability isn't great either. In air combat, poor maneuverability puts you at a disadvantage, and if your missiles aren't as good as the opponent's, you're in even more trouble. When it comes down to it, the J-35 is at a real risk of becoming outmatched by the F-35 in direct confrontation. The J-16, often touted as one of China's main combat aircraft, really isn't all it's cracked up to be. In order to carry more weapons, its weight increased significantly, which led to a sharp drop in maneuverability. It's now even less agile than the original Su-27, whose design it's based on. In battle, with its heavy frame and sluggish movements, the J-16 would be an easy target, likely to be shot down in no time. No matter how much the J-16 tries to perform against the F-35, it's still going to get dominated. Ironically, the most maneuverable aircraft in China's Air Force right now is still the Russian-imported Su-35. This is pretty embarrassing for China, which constantly brags about its strength of its aviation industry, yet relies on foreign imports to fill the gaps. It's like slapping themselves in the face. China's military modernization over the years might look impressive on the surface, but underneath it all, there are still so many problems. If a real war were to break out, with all these underperforming systems, the outcome doesn't look good for the CCP. Of course, they won't admit that and will continue boasting to try to fool the public. But the truth can't be hidden forever, and eventually, these shortcomings will be exposed. Mm -hmm.